The number one killer in the United States is heart disease. When you add stroke in with heart disease, you're dealing with an enormous amount of people, almost 700,000 plus people dying between the two. I'm Gary Nall. In our special documentary, we're going to explore heart disease, its real causes, and more importantly, the natural and non-toxic approaches to helping save lives. You'll learn about L-carnosine and L-carnitine and coenzyme Q10 and exercise and diet, the genetic uh, issue by some of the leading advocates for a healthier lifestyle. Join us now as we explore heart disease, a natural approach. Heart disease is the number one killer of all people in every population throughout the world. And this is a fact and has been for many years because the approach to heart disease is not complete, it's superficial. Cardiovascular disease is the leading killer of both men and women in the United States. Heart failure is now increasing in this country. Why? Because people, because of the new modalities in the management of heart disease, people are living longer and have more heart damage. In an interesting but sad study and research that was done a few years back, kids that were killed in car accidents that underwent autopsies, when the pathologist was doing the autopsy, they checked the coronary vessels to see if there was plaque beginning in these teenagers, and they saw significant plaque streaks. So placking in the blood vessels in the coronaries doesn't start when you're 50, 60 or older. It starts in the teens in the American population, and this is a horrible process. You know, traditional Western medicine is a very conservative field, and sometimes it's very hard to get people to change direction. As simply as saying both men and women can have heart attacks, even though there have been statistics since the 1980s that showed more women were dying of heart disease than men. Except women didn't have the Hollywood heart attack, clutching their chest, being short of breath, with the numbness is radiating down the, the arm or they break out into a sweat. They can have those symptoms, but instead, my investigations into the medical literature, I found that there were numerous studies done by nurses that recognized that women's symptoms could be very different. Women can have a heart attack without having chest pain. That was an article in the New England Journal two years ago, shows that uh, women can have difficulty sleeping, anxiety, uh, not feeling well, difficulty breathing, or gastrointestinal problems, and P.S., it's a heart attack. That's why women are being undertreated and undertested for cardiovascular disease. So we know that the symptoms in women are different, and we know that there are some statistics that don't go in women's favor, like the delay in getting treated. Um, oftentimes women delay just calling 911, so there's a two to four hour delay in the women getting to the hospital. This year, the American Heart Association cited statistics that more than 250,000 women died of a heart attack last year. Two-thirds of those women never made it to the hospital. They died without any warning sign at all. What they did find is that 90% of those women had at least one risk factor that we can attribute to not having an active lifestyle, smoking, being overweight, diabetic, that led them to have this heart attack. Why they died with no warning sign at all is because they were totally unaware of the warning signs for heart attack. What are what we call the independent risk factors for, for heart attack and stroke? And what do I mean by an independent risk factor? You could have one of these things and you are increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So the first one is family history. You better look out what happened with your mother and father, especially today, if we see someone with a family history of what we call premature heart disease, someone having a heart attack in their 40s and 50s. And keep in mind, years ago, when I see patients coming into my centers in New York, I would say, oh, you're 50, you're going into the heart attack years. Forget about that, that's over with. I now have people coming in in their 30s with heart attack. All the diseases that we thought were those of the older population, 80s and such are now being seen in the younger population. You're seeing people in their teens and 20s with obesity and hypertension and high cholesterol and circulatory problems. Having a family history increases 
a man and a woman's risk for having heart disease. If your mother was 65 or younger and dad 50 or younger, that will increase your risk by 25 to 50 percent. Uh, the number two is cholesterol, okay? There's still the cholesterol controversy. Uh, a lot of holistic doctors say, oh, it's not important. That's not true. Cholesterol is still important. Why? Because it's an independent risk factor for heart attack and stroke. Higher cholesterol, more heart attacks and strokes. The link between cholesterol and heart disease is not new. In fact, researchers in the late 1930s noted the um, association between having high cholesterol and heart disease. Now, today we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated. We look at the HDL, the LDL, the good and the bad. We look at triglycerides. And then we're doing now uh, what we call lipoprotein fractionation. Uh, we're measuring the particle size of the LDL. The smaller the particle size, the more atherogenic. The small particle size LDL is more increased in diabetes and is associated with infl inflammation and accelerated arteriosclerosis. There's something called LP little a, and there's a new uh, 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 lipid test called LP PLA2, which is a, uh, a, a lipid enzyme that when elevated tells you that your uh, plaque in your arteries is more prone to rupture. Everybody is looking at their cholesterol. Okay, my cholesterol should be so low that I can hardly see it. That's the modality now. What people don't realize is that cholesterol is important. Cholesterol is the basis for all our sex hormones. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, DHEA, pregnenolone, all those hormones come from one molecule called cholesterol. So it really doesn't behoove us to look for cholesterol below 150. Okay, because below 150, we actually increase our chances of cancer. Okay, so of course, the majority of patients get to the doctor and they have a total cholesterol of 200. Of course, they're going to be put on medication. Lipitor, Mevacor, you can name it. The problem is the following. Cholesterol per se is not the enemy. It's the oxidized cholesterol that's the enemy. It's not the sheer numbers. Not only that, but when total cholesterol is 200, and your HDL, which is the good cholesterol, which is high density lipoprotein. If it's high, if it's a 60 or 70, now the ratio between the 200 or let's say 250 and the 70 becomes like almost like three, three to one, which is not a bad ratio. So just because somebody has cholesterol of 240 doesn't mean, in my opinion, and I'm minority opinion, I have to say, they should be on medication that has tremendous side effects. When you're a little older like me, not giving my age, but when you're a little older, you've been around, you know what the old guidelines were. And years ago, I hate to tell you, when I was a heart surgeon, the normal cholesterol was 300. Now it's 200. So the people, no wonder the people think the doctors are crazy. The levels we like now are a total cholesterol of just around 200 or less. The LDL or bad cholesterol to be less than 130. And now we're looking at levels of less than 100 in people who have already already have heart disease. You have to look at the levels of good cholesterol, the HDL, and in women we want that level, the HDL cholesterol, to be greater than 50 and in men greater than 40. There's a difference because throughout our lives we have higher levels of HDL compared to men. Our HDL levels are higher than men until around menopause where the HDL level flattens out or plateaus, and in some, it can go down. And we, we get a little closer to the HDL levels of men. So we need more HDL to protect us from heart disease. The other thing that is a risk factor, not necessarily an independent risk factor, but it's homocysteine. Homocysteine is a protein that's usually metabolized in the body, but because of a reaction that requires B vitamins that for one reason or another may be deficient in an individual, the homocysteine isn't metabolized. So instead, when it accumulates, it promotes the buildup of cholesterol or plaque in the arteries, what the process we call atherosclerosis.